Hello there, my name is Boai Shoshan. I'm an editor here at Southbank Investment Research. Now, a couple of weeks ago, a colleague of mine told me about a book called Breaking the Code of History by David Murren. I was quite intrigued by the premise of the book and decided I'd get a copy of it myself. Now, I was so fascinated by the contents of this and the models for understanding history and the future, I became determined to get David Murren himself into our studio for a conversation with him, because he does have some very fascinating ideas. He's got quite a, a career, quite a CV behind him. He was exploring the jungles of Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Islands a while ago, working in oil exploration, before he started trading at a Wall Street bank and then setting up his own investment firm, his own hedge fund, where he used his models for understanding society, geopolitics and markets in order to make returns for himself and for his investors. Now, he does have some very radical ideas about the future, which I'd love to discuss with him, and I hope you find the next hour interesting. We'll see you at the end. David, thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure to be here, Boaz. Now, David, before we get into some of your models for predicting uh, the future and indeed how, how successfully they've predicted the past, I'd like to dive in uh, to some, some of your very bold predictions about the future, specifically regarding World War III, uh, the status of the dollar as a global reserve currency, and U the UK's place in the future. Big start then. <laughs> uh, well, basically, part of my thesis is a five-stage of empire model, which um, in 2002, when I created it, implied and predicted that America was in terminal decline, the fifth stage, and highlighted that journey towards decline. And at the same time, it highlighted that China was the second of the Asian super empires and was in expansion. And it would move into the gap aggressively to create a hegemonic challenge. As it did. And sequentially, the peak of that hegemonic challenge will come at the next commodity cycle peak in 2025 to 27. And wars are not fought idealistically. They're fought over resources. And commodity resource peak spikes are, the, the in effect, the drumbeat of conflict. So my conclusion back then was these two systems would rise to equality, there would be hegemonic challenge, and the great risk for conflict, global conflict, would be 2025, maybe slightly early from 24 to 27, and somewhere in that band we would have a human systems threat of World War III unless certain steps were taken. And those steps really result in, in deterrence. So recognizing where China is, which it has a time frame for its hegemonic challenge to be completed by 2030, much earlier than people realize because of its negative demographics and yep. because of the rise of India. And India representing the same strategic threat as Russia did to Germany twice, as in it forced the timing of when Germany acted and went to war in right. 14 and 39, 40, and, 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 and obviously invading Russia. India has the same role. So the conclusion is that she understands that time frame and that he knows what he's doing. And part of that process for the Chinese was to dupe the West into thinking that if we invested in their capital structure, we gave them the things that we value, they would be like us. And it's amazing how many people don't really understand how Deng's plan was to do that. And they're now in a different phase, which is they don't need us to invest in them. In fact, they're busy chopping off every investor's fingers quietly at the moment because they've shifted to another model, which is much like the Nazi four-year plan, an internally fueled consumer society that militarizes and starts its road to an accelerated point of conflict, uh, all of which we've seen evolve in the past year or so. So we've got a very sleepy West. Um, yes, Biden's focusing on China, but he's not doing the things that require us to combat them, which is a full isolation, an iron curtain type structure, new supply chains that are away from China, new manufacturing systems, all those things urgently needed and very large investments in the appropriate military responses. The failure to create a proper Navy plan, a US Navy plan in his administration is really concerning because the US Navy is the front line in containment. So there are many signals that Biden's a Biden is giving and in that process, that's really key, is all the great conflicts before have had things called pilot wars. And those pilot wars are these little conflicts that no one notices, like the Boer War was right. to Britain and, and in South Africa. And to Germany, that was in hegemonic early phase, shall we challenge mode, watching us fail to bring the, the, the Boer farmers to Brook over a period of years and taking 500,000 English soldiers to do it was a sign of weakness. And that begat the arms race when the dreadnought was launched and the whole thing came about because it was really a failed pilot war in the time it took to prosecute and be successful. 
If you look at the Spanish Civil War, it was a similar pilot war. It sort of represented that the Britain and France just left Spain to its own devices, let the communists fight with the Nazis or the, you know, the fascists, and they just left it. That was a sign of weakness, and certainly a failure to push Germany out of the Ruhr when they moved into the Rhinelands in yep. March 36 was a massive signal. And conversely, a positive example was the Falklands War. The Falklands War changed the perspective of the Kremlin. The capitalists were weak, and one day their large army would roll into Europe and essentially capitalism would fall, and suddenly this thing called Britain under Thatcher that had nuclear weapons went 8,000 miles and determinedly fought for its territory. And it irrevocably changed their perspective in the use of force. And that's why the Cold War stayed cold, a positive outcome. Right. And today we have a failed war in Iraq, a failed war in Libya, Syria, and now this precipitous withdrawal from Afghanistan, and they are red flags to a, to a bull. Uh, she is sitting there thinking, I'm gonna carve up and that I'm going to do exactly what I plan to do. So unless we wake up to the threat we face, then that increases the inevitability of the attempt by China when the commodity cycle really goes into overdrive to make its move. The withdrawal from Afghanistan is, of course, making the U.S. look uh, particularly bad in that particular pilot war, though the Middle East in general uh, is littered with uh, military failures uh, and at the same time you have social unrest at home because unhappy with the conflict as a whole. Looking on how this reflects on the U.S. as its, in, you know, in its imperial uh, status, and as you describe an imperial status of decline, how does that uh, play into markets when you're looking at the value of the U.S. dollar and its status as global reserve currency? Well, hegemons, you know, at their peak, seem untouchable. I and mean, if you go back to, you know, the '90s, 2000, the Cold War had been vanquished. Unipolarity. And, and we lived in a world of a unipolar world. No one could ever imagine that America wasn't going to be at the top of that tree. So of course it could borrow from whoever it wanted, it could do what it wanted. And it had to go through a series of financial reversals to start to make the cracks, where exactly what happens in decline, which is it starts to move from a competitive economy to a, a to, to reduced competitive economy with more leverage. So, you know, let's just have a guess. You know, 2003, we'll leverage ourselves three times and then we're gonna look healthy. Bottom of 2008, well, you know, we'll leverage ourselves 10 times, and now that looks healthy. And by the end of the pandemic, let's leverage ourselves 40 times and look healthy. Right. And anyone who understands what a leveraged portfolio does, it looks really healthy if you've got like 0.1% growth and 40 times the leverage because you make four t 40 units or four per say 4% a month, and suddenly you don't because the 0.1 goes to zero and nothing disappears. And that's exactly where America is. This highly leveraged system that people think is healthy but is not healthy. And the speed at which the shift is going to take place, I think, is going to shock everyone. The erosion of the dollar has been going on for quite a while. And in fact, this next, the, 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 the move that we are seeing at the moment is we've had one move down since those March 2020 lows. We're in a counter trend move at the moment, which all markets do. They don't go in a straight line. And as risk comes off, we'll see that counter trend movement reach its conclusion and peak. And then I think after that, somewhere in the next three months when that peak is made, then we're gonna to start to move for a very, very big dollar decline. As America comes under pressure from all three of its asset classes, equity markets falling, bonds falling, and essentially the dollar falling because it's losing its reserve status. And I think that scenario is upon us within the next in 12 months. Considering how the dollar is used for commodity pricing, and of course, uh, dollar denominated assets are seen somewhat as safe havens, so when we talk about US real estate, and indeed US stocks to some degree. Do you think what this uh, dollar losing its value like that would lead to a rise in the, in the, in the price of those assets, like for example, some commodities or uh, well, real estate? It's a bit more complicated now. Imagine what's being created is this, I call it this giant super bubble. And it's a doomsday bubble because at the end of it, there's no way out. And essentially, so much money has been printed in the past 12 months yep. that it's gone everywhere into all aspects. And so people talk about the housing bubble, but the housing bubble's going. Lumber's already had its cycle. It, you know, it went right to a peak high. No one spotted it. My work allowed me to predict the high, and it collapsed nearly 60% from that high. That means that the property asset cycle in the States is super vulnerable and just waiting to fall like everything else. We've seen it move into cryptocurrencies, which are really a response 
to the, the, the reserve status gradually being lost or this sort of unconscious recognition it will be lost and trying to fill the gap. An externality. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. What do you do when you lose the dollar? It's the beginning of that process. Well, it has all sorts of flaws and it's also created a sub-bubble, which I think is going to work its way out of the system before it becomes actually, like gold and silver, possibly another whole surge. But we go down before we go up as the whole implosion takes place. So you can see all the pieces in the puzzle already. And the other piece of the puzzle is rates. And essentially, this zero rate environment is now on the move towards a much higher rate environment. And we've got two things happening. We've got systematic inflation, which has been suppressed. And a lot of that, you know, when we should have seen inflation in the past 20 years, we had cheap manufacturing from China. I think with this Cold War dynamic accelerating, we have to discount the fact that that's not going to happen. And we have to find other cheap manufacturing sources, and it's going to be expensive in the transition. Yes. That's a structural problem that you know, we, people should be addressing and leaders should be addressing right now. For America, Mexico is a natural. Or in fact, really, for the first world countries, they should be thinking about automated factories. And if they're talking about infrastructural investment, it's to produce internal manufacturing that doesn't require transportation, doesn't expose you to your supply chains being cut off in times of conflict or constricted in places During like... During a pandemic. Exactly. The sewage can, you build things where you start. It's green and also gives you control of your manufacturing base. So I think this sort of... There is a whole revolution in the generation of new factories that build multitudes of things at the same time. And there should be a big focus on that. But before, we've got this big gap between what was made in China and where else do you make it. So there's inflationary dynamics from that. There's the first surge of commodity inflation from the lows in 2020, which is wave one of the surge. And I think we are at the peak of it. And when we have a, our asset bubble collapse, which is imminent right now, that will reduce demand and there will be a retracement. But we shouldn't be diluted in that case, whereas you know, assets like shares and houses will just keep going down. Those guys represent core investment opportunities in six to nine months' time. Not now, because over five years, I think commodity inflation is going to be unbelievable. And to give you some idea of the, the previous conflict relationships with the commodity cycle peak, yep. 1914, World War I was the peak, or the, the peak of a commodity cycle. So no one talks about the fact that actually that war was about resources and the price of resources that triggered the actions. The next cycle peak was 75. And in 75, you had a Cold War paradigm. You had a consumer society in the West head on with a commodity producing society, Russia. And of course, their system looked economically incredibly viable in 1975 yep. because they were producing commodities that were really valuable. And consumer society was doubly nobbled because it put input inflation and drag on their economies. So th yeah. And psychologically, we were losing in 75. We, you know, we, it was an unwinnable war. And so that was interesting because you had a producer matched off against the consumer. And the spike wasn't as big as 14 on a relative basis. But the one in 25, you have two consumer societies head to head. And you have Russia on the side deciding which way it goes, which is another conversation. So I think this commodity price inflation spike is going to be like nothing we've seen before. Uh, to give maybe, maybe an idea of how high you think commodities could go in, you know, in the next few years, for example. I mean, how extreme do you think it might be when you have those two consumer empires on either side of the planet? By 2025. I mean, levels that really are difficult to even imagine. Talk about gold, you know, gold with its inflation dynamics, 10 times higher than it is now, five times. I mean, multiples, silver, you know, $100. You're talking about things that, things that are really difficult to comprehend. But that's what happens at the end. You end up with this super whoosh. It's exponential. Who could imagine where U.S. stocks got to? You know, if you were back 10 years ago, it's the same whoosh that takes place right. in that final surge. So that final surge is going to be hugely challenging. And for a Western economy, a big problem because, you know, this sort of incremental growth model with low interest rates that, you know, kept sort of, <laughs> how can you call it, an intensive care unit keeping an old person alive. Right. And Europe is especially like that. And America's become like that. The only opportunity is to create a high growth, highly innovative economy. And the only country in Europe that, or in the West that can do that is Britain. And there's a decision that has to be made swiftly by our government in terms of what type of economy can survive a stagflationary environment. And there is only one. It's a high growth, low tax regime. And it isn't a question of the preference of whether you believe in no taxes, whether you think it's morally right, whether you get revoted. There is only one survival strategy available as stagflation consumes the Western world. And that is low tax, high investment regimes with, with high innovation. 
Now, this brings us to Britain, and we have uh, spoken, we have referred to your uh, five stages of empire previously. At this point, I'd like to, to uh, you to know, give us a little crash course on what the five stages are, uh, and then we can speak about Britain's place in it. Cause Before I find you can it slip if you're American. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, okay, so, so essentially, I think that all living things have fractal dynamics. So the best way to describe the five stages of a human system which can be an individual, it can be an empire, it can be a nation, it can be all manner of identities with a defined border of collective behavioral patterns, are that you are born, as we, you, you or I were, fairly helpless, and on the measure of energy and wisdom, we were pretty low on the count. And somewhere in your curve, you'll go up and there will be a peak, and you'll wake up one day, and that day is your peak of your wisdom and your energy combined, and you have no idea it ever happened, you carry on for a bit in denial yep. as you slip down the curve. And somewhere at the end of the peak, if you have the privilege of getting to the end of it without you know, some truncated event, yep. essentially you wake up and as an old person, you lose your energy and you lose your wisdom, you can't remember, and you're at the back of the beginning. That cycle just stuck in my mind. And that's essentially the cycle of a system. So the first stage of a system is what I call regionalization, expanding demographics. And demographics are like an age, like counter. So with expanding demographics, the system needs more organization. And normally as it expands from some base unit, the people at the top at that stage are narrowly enfranchised. The people who are demographically expanded at the bottom are quite poor and unrecognized. And these people at the top are tend to be collective thinkers, and they tend to be in an epitomization of that as a left brain thought process iterative, controlling, what, because they have the whole system in their hands. And then the bottom rises up and says we want more, and the civil war takes place. And that civil war allows the facility of a right-brained, sort of um, individualistic, maverick, anti-entropy thought process, which invariably beats the enfranchised iterative process in a civil war that you know, historically has always been pretty bloody. And by the end of it, you end up with a right brain system led by right brain people who have gone through an entropic experience of conflict and therefore they're not there by accident there because they're highly capable and they share the collective values of the system and the system's militarized and it literally rushes out into the second phase, runs down its resource chains, militarizes its resource chains, starts to dominate the systems around it with an algorithmic process of, I dominate you, my neighbor, now I'm two units. I get to my next neighbor, it takes me a third of the time, my next neighbor a fifth of the time, and it creates an exponential process of expansion. And then you get to the peak of expansion where you can't go any further and you finish the expansionary phase and you start to establish your system because now it starts to fill in in the gaps in the interior and that's maturity. And maturity, you start to see something else happen. Those mavericks that have built the system get displaced as the system becomes more stable by the more iterative thinkers who were there at the bottom of the cycle. And they start to become more political and more iterative because they don't need to be lateral because every day is fairly similar and the resources of the system allow them to overcome the challenges. So then you reach the peak of the system and at the peak of the system, there's another civil war. And that civil war is a subtle shift or a less subtle shift between the right-brained individualistic people that built the system collectively and a more iterative process that now want to run the system that's stable. And that's actually the beginning of decline because creativity is slowly being removed from the system unknowingly, even though it seems to dominate its whole environment. At that stage, the system is highly tolerant, highly integrative, multi-religious, all sorts of things happen and all systems do the same things until they start to roll over the top and one day they start to move into overextension. They no longer earn as much as they spend. They no longer as create as much as depleted from the system. It's an overextended dynamic, but only to the perceptive can you start to see it. But it's a hallmark of less and less maverick people sit at the top. Most of them are just retired out as irritants and then are removed from the system until you get to this moment of decline. And the moment of decline is some kind of definitive reverse. For America, it was 9-11. America turned to something it wasn't after 9-11. Everyone, everything the terrorists describe America as, beforehand you would have said, maybe a bit extreme, don't agree with it. Afterwards, two years later, it became that entity. And most importantly, it lost its moral imperative to rule. Once you lose your moral imperative to rule through rendition and torture, the very values that you espoused that you couldn't do, everything else starts to fall underneath. And so you know, the things that happened were you, America was subverted by neo neocons that basically didn't understand the application of power, what it really meant, and they bust the system by overextending it and, and further pushing it into fall. And then narcissistic leadership 
is common at that stage. The whole system moves from one of service, and I serve the system, and the system rises on a service culture, to I am now more important than the system. And narcissism in leadership and narcissism in society just increases, and the system just starts to break apart as it borrows more, becomes less creative, and all the things we've seen in America, particularly that cycle. When I wrote the book, Breaking the Code of History, I made the assumption that America, Britain, and Europe were all collectively, as part of the what I call the super Western Christian empire, in terminal decline. But I created some bell measures and some sort of intelligence mechanisms to become alert to systems that were changing. And my favorite one was Olympic gold medals. Yep. And uh, so sport is not just sport. Sport is a ramification of um, a national energy this system, people collectively have energy and a nation has energy. And it's competitiveness and its ability to organize its competitive mechanisms and to fund them appropriately with the goal of winning. So you don't just happen to win. You win because the system has a large amount of national energy. And you can see the rise of America through the medal table. You can see the rise of Nazi Germany as it appeared. You can certainly see the rise of the USSR in the Cold War. And you could see China coming through its medal trajectory. Ahead of time. A ahead of time. And then all of a sudden, there was Britain number three. And I must admit, as an Englishman that was brought up to always look in the mirror and think, oh, aren't we useless? You know, <laughs> how many things do we cock up? It was a really fascinating moment to think, hang on, that's really one of my signals and it's happening to us. What does it mean? And then, of course, we came second. And that wasn't just a random moment. It was a pattern of national energy that came about through Major's national lottery vision and all the things that go with it. Yes, you can bring them down to moments and people and decisions, but it represented a collective energy. And in this one, for example, although we were slightly less placed, it was very obvious that the system that was once created through lottery dispersion of money was starting to become a bit more abundant in its performance. But there were individuals funding sports people in lateral games yep. that were now coming to the top. So it's an example of the whole system manifesting aspiration. Look at Ineos. You know, Ineos is a product of you know, three people's incredible success. And we are right up there, finally, for the America's Cup, third time round, which requires money, perseverance, and wealth. Yep. It's all over the place. And yes, we sort of didn't quite get there in the European Football Championship. We didn't quite get there in rugby. But we're really in so many sports right up there that our national energy is unassailable. And that manifests in all sorts of other aspects. And that's when I realized that actually we had troughed in 79. Thatcher was the kickstart and turning point. And essentially the Brexit represented our civil war. And so the moment the referendum was called, I knew which way it was going to go. I really had a strong, uh, I wrote about it at the time, talked about what it really represented, the processes it would go through and how we would come out the other side. Saw Boris a long way out as the only possible person with the energy the system would require and really talked everyone through every step, although it seemed illogical to, uh, to the people. It was highly logical using this code to understand human systems. You do hear an awful lot uh, about sort of the decline of Britain these days. You get fair, many journalists, uh, for example, at the FT, and you know plenty of other papers who, who write a lot saying, you know, Britain, uh, this is this is a vainglorious attempt to resurrect the uh, the glory days of empire, and it's very it's not very patriotic. But what you're describing is almost like a, a new cycle of empire, effectively, that we've managed to, to get back into. We are in the second stage of our cycle. And you know, when the word Global Britain was coined, I almost fell off my chair with laughter because Global Britain, when, when you write those, if you read, you know, you've read the book, but you look at the stages of the second stages of empire, everything in those stages are manifest in the vision of Global Britain, apart from one thing, the appropriate militarization to support right. that expansion. And the th reason why I think we, we've been through this process that's a little bit more complex than other transitions between regionalization and expansion to empire is in every other system, warfare and civil war meant that that really did from the top down shifted from a left brain collective process of iteration to a more maverick individualistic thought process with, with a whole cascade of people with that mindset from the top all the way through government to military leaders, which is incredibly powerful. To give you an idea, the, the greatest generational war machine that e epitomized that value set was Nelson's Navy. They were all of the mindset. Captains, first lieutenants, the whole Navy was structured because of the environment of the sea to actually favor that thought process. Right, and it yeah. was absolutely unstoppable. 
So when you, we, what we haven't really done, and thank goodness we didn't do it, was we didn't kill each other over it. It felt at times like we might, and it had all the energies of it. And Certainly, you know, yeah. between friends, it fell out, and all sorts families, of yeah. family members that just wouldn't talk over the table. It was a big thing. What was quite remarkable is that our construct of democracy held the, one of the most powerful social changes a system can go through. And now we have gone back together again, better than you could ever imagine under any circumstances. But the downside, which we need to consciously manage, is we didn't complete the transition. We completed the change at the top with Boris and his cabinet and the vision and the manifestation of global Britain. All of those things are commensurate with that evolution. But government, heads of businesses, all of the people that sit among the institutions have been left untouched. And the issue there is Cummings represented that energy of change. And in many ways, he was you know, right about the need for change. But his concept of implementation was so egregious and so, dare I say it, emotionally driven rather than logical and constructive and, and smart in the way he applied it, that the institutions with the other mindset were able to cast him off. And now he's cast off. There's no replication for that energy that we need so desperately. So our leadership is compromised by institutions that don't think the same way. They think in opposition. They don't think and they don't see. Every, the number of surprises we've had over the past two years is because they are epitomized the lateral thinking required for strategic planning. So we still haven't completed that change and we need to consciously understand the great credit we have through getting through it without the bloodletting, but at the same time now engineering those changes as swiftly as possible using this social construct which I described, which would allow us to liberate our energy more effectively. What, you know, what form would that take if you're looking for you know, the ideal way in which that, uh, that change could take place? What would it require? Well, I, I, think, I think it needs exterior advisors, and there are an awful lot of exterior advisors that come from the old mindset, but you need exterior advisors and not part of a system that think laterally, that can start to challenge the, and, and review. The Ministry of Defence, for example, is just not fit for purpose. At a time when it should be, it doesn't and cannot do the things it's meant to do. So when Churchill faced that in the, you know, in the war, he created alternative organisations. And he used the alternative organisations to move faster while trying to create change more slowly in the, in the larger institutions that were the bodies that the government used. So we, if I was you know, advising Boris, I would say you need two parts to this. You need you know, a very, very quick-footed strategic thought process group that really is founded in competency rather than just some traditional I am and you start to change policy from that level and you change it underneath with radical reform inside groups, but they need to come from right-brained, you know, individualistic reformers that are grounded in knowledge rather than just ego to enact both sides of the sausage, and we need it yesterday. Uh, now, looking at you know, the need for militarization, uh, I'm sure plenty of people would say, well, why, why would we need to spend all of this money on uh, you know, new uh, Royal Navy carriers and uh, new dreadnoughts? Uh, this is often seen by people as you know, a, big, a big waste of time, unproductive, capital expenditure. Why is it then uh, that Britain needs to remilitarize? What is What threat does uh, Britain need to face off against? So, so we face, we face on the traditional enemy of Russia. And, and Russia is about to become very wealthy through this next commodity cycle. So just if you had a single polar world with Russia and Europe, how we cope with Russia is a critical part of it. And Rapprochement has to be the only solution. If we could have worked with Stalin, as we did do, by need to, to, to combat Germany in the Second World War, Putin isn't Stalin, he's a far lesser version. He's tricky, he's difficult. There are lots of things which are in opposition to the concepts of democracy. But actually, rapprochement now is strategically the only route because he faces a problem too. He doesn't want to be the only country sitting next to his ally, potentially China in the future. See the West disappear and know he's next, because he will be. So he sits just like Stalin did on a knife edge between the West that he despised because of a capitalist and the Nazis that he doubly despised because they're his neighbors and, and e even more so in many degrees. And he made that compromise. Putin faces a very similar process and Western politicians have to wake up to that. That now is the time because as the commodity cycle re-kicks, then there's no way he's coming back. He's alienated and his pride is well and truly pricked after the way the West treated the fall of Russia, which was despicable, to be honest. He has some you know, rights in saying that. So we have to have really like the, the rapprochement that Britain made with France in 1906, recognizing Germany was the continental power to contain. We need something like the Entente Cordiale, and we need to really understand how to do that. Um, so that's the first part. Um, but 
you cannot do it from weakness. And so if Putin sees weakness, you'll never get him to the table. The only way you'll get him to the table is when he sees absolute strength that he cannot push through. And the only way we can do that is to is more money on defense. And for example, his submarine force is just growing and growing. We cannot protect our own waters and airspace easily. There are submarines lurking in our waters that shouldn't be there. Our deterrent is, in a, is at risk. There are whole parts of this which are embarrassing, where our Navy is completely overstretched and we do not have the facilities to combat Russia alone in our waters. So that's the first piece, a and especially as uh, Russia has invested in six core strategic weapons, which all of which are scarily pieces of kit that we don't have counters for. So we've been caught napping, in effect. So yep. we need it for that reason. But even if we could create the rapprochement with Russia, and we can only do that from strength, and not uh, we're building them in 10 years, they're in the water and they're doing their job strength, China is a much bigger systematic issue. China's been in expansion since the Boxer Revolution. Um, it is the second of the Asian empires. The first was Japan. So we have already, between a Western super empire and an Asian super empire, we've already seen the conflicts that started, for example, yes. with Russia and Japan, yeah. and that was the beginning of it you know, in, the, in that particular conflict, and the Japanese were successful, note. Um, and so China has been working in a strategic way that's difficult for Westerners to comprehend. I've spent 35 years studying Chinese martial arts. They are the most sophisticated, cunning, devious thinkers, perhaps on a kin of Britain when it gets mobilized, but in the Western world, but we're not mobilized at the moment. And so essentially they run in rings around us. They encourage the West to invest in their own demise. We still have politicians and businessmen who think they can invest in China and make money, yeah, yeah. and they are selling their children's future, which incidentally took place in Germany and twice. There were pro-Germans into 1914. Lloyd George led the charge. He obfuscated the British response as a response. Uh, uh, actually, he encouraged aggression from Germany because Lloyd George's perspective was perceived by the Kaiser as one that would keep Britain out of the war when they invaded France, but they made the mistake of going through Belgium. So we've had this before. People who are blind to aggression, who see commercial advantage and portray their own societies. And we do need people to stand up and actually say, that's not appropriate anymore. This is, this is a real threat. And you know we've seen threat. I mean, I if you go back and say, how did we not catch Germany? Oh, well, let's think about it. They had concentration camps. Yep, well, well we ignored that. We just tick. Yep. Uh, they've managed to annex countries around them. Oh, tick, that's Hong Kong. They managed to subject their culture on the countries that they've, Tibet, Hong Kong, their whole independent system has disappeared. Anyone who's an individual is in prison or disappeared. It's terrifying. It's yeah. happening all over again, and yet we're happy to go and buy a Chinese model or you know everything from China. So we need to wake up to that threat and understand that the Chinese will only be deterred by strength because they will move if there's an opportunity and they won't move if there's deterrence. So our strength comes through deterrence, and we need to wake up and make sure that happens. And in a world where America is weakening, America's like this old, powerful man that's now in a Zimmer frame with you know, lots of money and lots of influence but doesn't use it wisely, Britain is, an, is the energy that can shore that up. But we need the intention and the manifest to do it. And, and what people don't realize is global Britain has set us head to head with the Chinese because the Chinese are expansive and Britain is now expansive in global. So whether we like it or not, we're going head to head with the Chinese. We can't avoid it and we need to prepare for it. And where is China in the, uh, in the stages of empire cycle now, would you say? So uh, China is, is well and truly, uh, its expansionary second stage started in about 96. And the evidence of a 50-year plan of expanding underneath the umbrella of American power is overwhelming. And it was a damn cunning plan. You know, started off by making them look like us, which they've done, build a manufacturing base like, uh, like us. Now they're the manufacturing base of the world. And they destroyed our manufacturing base in the process. Time, yeah. All of those things were part of their plan. The only thing that's changed, which is interesting, is that I think if Deng woke up, he would have said to Xi, oh, you stuck your neck out too early. And Xi stuck his neck out for a number of reasons. One is he's a very, very aggressive, capable leader, brought up under a father who was you know, close to Mao, kicked out. Um, he knows that there's only one thing you can do to ensure your survival in the Communist Party, and that's sit at the top of it ruthlessly. So he is committed to that path, and he sees the same for China as an extension of his own perspective for his own survival. So when Obama was his opposition, and Obama represented, and I said this at the time, you know, Obama, Obama was the absolutely classic president of decline. He came from the underclasses, 
because the demographic of the underclasses gave him the uh, electoral power to do so. And people who rise from the underclasses, whoever they are, whatever their education, whatever their race, focus on the internal social dynamics rather than the maintenance of the borders of the empire. Yep. They're always neglected. And they were neglected and they imploded. And she just moved into the space and he accelerated the mechanism, you know, from, I would say, 50 years to 30 years. And the more that America withdrew, the more they moved, the more emboldened they were. The Belt and Road system, the whole process of colonialism through debt and control and manipulation, all of those came under the Obama period. Then came Trump. And Trump's was a response and predictable because essentially America gave too much power away too quickly. And the unconscious electorate said, hang on a second, make me great again. And Trump just walked right into the phrase. And along he came with the promise of making them great. Problem is narcissists never make anyone great, just themselves. And that's fundamentally what he did. He, whatever he said he was going to do, he didn't do it. If he had delivered on it, it would be a different world. But he didn't. Even his trade deal, you know, he ended up going to Xi and saying, I need to be in power, can you help me? How do you combat someone when you're asking for their help to be re-elected? You can't. But he did increase awareness of the threat to China, although he didn't actually create the mechanism to push them back. He did increase, he started to create secondary polarization, as I call it, which is the response of the hegemon that's been challenged to immune system response of saying, what do we do, how do we do it? But he didn't actually deliver anything. He made it worse. He destroyed alliances and relationships. He destroyed the trust in this process of democracy himself, and the capital rights were the personification of it. So he just weakened the system, not strengthened it. And that's why Biden was able to walk in for two reasons. One is essentially that America is becoming poorer, which is another sure sign of decline. And you end up with a few people who are wealthy through the printing of money. And the bottom of the pyramid is just not helped. So you end up with dislocations. And Obama is a socialist. I mean, Biden is a socialist. He's continued with the agenda. But that's exactly what's happened. Socialism comes at the end of the system where you try and help everyone with your balance sheet. It doesn't work. And, uh, and Biden is... Ca the Callahan that we had that ended our decline process appallingly. He's the same level of person. And the problem is for America, unless they, the Republicans eject Trump, another term of Trump will finish America off without the Chinese. <laughs> so the question there is essentially, can the Republican Party wake up sufficiently to enact a new form of leader? It had to be a military leader with strategic knowledge. Yep. So you know, an admiral would probably be my preference because of their strategic understanding. And that's the best survival route I can see through for America, a military character rising through the Republican Party, removing the Trumpites and creating a system that can defend itself again. Even then, that looks like it's going to be a bit too late. So it's, it's a very tricky. I can't quite see the, the roots out of it. And, and I think Britain's role in waking up is an important role because America might just not be able to do the things it really needs to do unless it has some weapons in Area 51, of course, or you know, some black programs that we don't know about, which right, is right. entirely possible, right. although I suspect not to definitively change the balance. So in the, in the event you got someone like, I don't know, Dan Crenshaw or somebody from the Republican Party ends up becoming uh, the president of the US, you still think it would be a managed decline stage for America? So one of the interesting things, so, so we have a life cycle. We're born and we die. The options we have extend our life. They extend our quality of life. They extend basically, you know, what we'd really like is a is a long curve and then bang. <laughs> that would be ideal for human <laughs> right, right, existence. Yeah, yeah. But we are going to die. And America is going to die as a system that's dominant. The, it, what's interesting is Britain rejuvenated itself with its old structure and the speed of rejuvenation is surprising historically. So the question is, can America preserve enough of its constructs to allow something else to come through? And I was really intrigued because I think film and the stories told in film rec recognize social moods and behaviors. Yes, right. And, and they predict them in many ways and, and, and resonate with them. And I, Isaac Ava Asimov's film, Foundation, which is for someone of my generation, the foremost piece of science fiction you read about right, right. how do you basically, when you know your civilization is falling, create a covenant or an ark which allows the next one to rise more quickly. And that's now on Apple TV, which I think is extremely resonant. Right. And so it comes back to the question right. of Britain actually is moving forward to hold the baton of Western democracy. And America will have to do what Britain did afterwards if we get through without conflict of live a period of reformation. And in, in effect, the Phoenix can't rise without the ashes. And I, the only way you can break that cycle or change it is you create an offshoot of yourself as you move into decline and something similar rises 
which, but it, the system itself, like your son or your daughter, is the same human paradigm. And Britain was the same with America. As we declined, our cousin took over. So one of those passings of the baton is possible. But I don't think you can just suddenly circumvent the terminal phases and say, oh, we can just go straight to expansion again. It's not possible. I mean, in the case of Britain, it did happen pretty quickly. I mean, if you're going from late 70s as terminal decline and then through to Thatcher in the 80s. It is. I mean, it's uh, surprisingly quickly. Let's go back, actually. The decline happened after the Second World War. We, yeah, true. You know, yeah. And the peak of the, the empire was at 1914 before the war started. That was truly our ultimate power at that stage. And it, we gradually like ro rolled downwards, even though after 1918 we end up with more, more in the Middle land, East, yeah. more land, you know, access to oil. In fact, decline was already setting in, and decline of empires takes time. But for America, that decline has been taking place since I would argue since 1990. So we're 30 years into that process, into the terminal phases. Um, and as the last of the Western Christian empires, it's even more vulnerable because it doesn't have another system like Britain coming up behind it. Well, we are there, but not enough. But I think. And therefore, I think Brexit's role is more interesting than just a group of people that decided that they wanted to be sovereignly independent and respected democracy, and they wanted to decide and break away from a moribund Europe that had lost its creativity, run by bureaucrats. Um, I, I think, actually, it represents the desire of the larger system to perpetuate democracy and freedom. And if Britain had stayed part of Europe, it would have been locked up and there would have been not a single element available to the super-Christian empire of to expand or reframe. And Britain represents that offshoot to reframe of the system. On that, on that note, with uh, Europe uh, and the UK, we're, well, the Eurozone in particular, and the UK breaking away from, from the EU, recently we have seen uh, the French get embarrassed with their uh, submarine deal with the Australians getting uh, sort of stolen out from under their noses by uh, the UK, the US, and uh, with Australia, of course. And what do you think? What do you think that story says? Because to me, it does speak uh, of a certain. I mean, of a certain, uh, you know, strike back at China, which is quite, uh, which I think is quite a masterstroke when it comes to nuclear submarines. I mean, what's your take on that? Because it doesn't speak to me entirely of decline. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a really interesting piece because the Australians, much as they were in the Second World, were highly vulnerable sitting in the south of, J of Japan. And we often think about Midway as the turning point, but the Battle of the Coral Sea was the turning point when the Japanese invasion force of Australia was turned back. Right. And, and so Australia understands what it's like to be vulnerable down there in the south to an Asian power which is expanding towards you for your resources and your land access. So they've been very, very aware of their dual problem of economic dependence through resource exports to China yep. and also China's aggression. And to give them credit, for 24 million people, they are the only country that consistently calls China out over the pandemic's source. Everyone else has buttoned up, but the Australians have been sitting there saying, sorry, we don't believe it's zoonotic. And they have relentlessly done that and paid the price for it. So if they were aware of the threat before, they are super aware of the threat now because they've been threatened with nuclear war. Who knows it? You know, all sorts of things which you think, how can you say that in public? What's interesting is their naval expansion was taking place well before that. They were anticipating this. So, for example, the Type 26 frigate order is a good manifestation. The air defense destroyers, their navy is going to be significantly of the proportion of our navy at the rate they're going. And they needed new submarines. And I remember speaking to senior officials in the government when they talked about it. And they said, well, that's interesting because when you go and buy a short fin Barracuda submarine at 4,500 tons and turn a nuclear submarine into a conventional submarine, there isn't a big enough power source to do that. So you're always underpowered. Yep. And some of the arguments, I think, were we can turn them nuclear and ship the contract over somewhere along the way. But they knew nuclear weapon energy at that stage wasn't acceptable to the electorate. So they went large conventional, large as they could with a conventional hull, hoping the French would solve the engineering problem, which was doubtful from the beginning. And one would argue the French were somewhat optimistic to offer it. Um, and the delays and the cost overruns come from perhaps the, the desire to sell something that didn't exist. So there was a vulnerability. In the meantime, since the pandemic, the electorate in Australia demands that it be defended because it sees China as an overt current and present threat. So the barrier of having a nuclear power plant disappears. So once you accept you're going to have a nuclear power plant, you don't want a 4,500-ton submarine. You want an 8,500-ton submarine with a greater sensor weapon suit. Yep, yep. So all of a sudden, you look at the contract. The French haven't delivered. You know, it's not working. And you can build a strategic alliance by bringing America in, because if you're going to buy British submarines, you need American permission. And all of a sudden, you move, base some of those submarines down in Perth, and the whole construct changes. 
And of course, and to Boris's great credit, I think he really understood what that represented. The image that you were building warships like the Type 26, which would now be astute, and essentially you would sell a product, you needed American permission for it, and you based your submarines, you forward based them in such a way as they could threaten the choke points for the Chinese trying to get out of the second island chain. Strategically brilliant. And I have to give you know, our, our Boris great credit for saying yes to it, because I think many prime ministers wouldn't have done. And you can understand why America's done it and Australia's done it. It's a win-win. But there's a sad reality. And that is that our astute program is so behind and we're going to build seven and they're still not rolling off and we know four maybe just about that they won't be able to build them in Australia. And unless we do something to create a national warship shipbuilding program on an emergency basis, those submarines won't even come in line in time for the time frame I'm talking about. So what are you left with? You're left with the need for an emergency shipbuilding program for the delivery to Australia and the politicians will have to make it clear to the electorate it's too complicated to build in Australia. Impossible when you look at the complexity of those submarines. They're like building a space shuttle. They are amazing, amazing vessels. And we need an emergency shipbuilding program for our own Navy to expand along the lines I've discussed earlier and to support allies who wish to then buy our products. We need to shift. It's interesting, under a new Labour, there was something of an attempt uh, by probably, probably Gordon Brown, really, uh, to quell Scottish independence by uh, creating lots of Navy jobs, obviously, for building uh, a Royal Navy expansion. And so now we have this beautiful aircraft carrier, which uh, we can't actually use without the help of the US. You know, we've got American US Navy Marine pilots on it with US Marine Corps uh, F-35s on it. And I do wonder whether or not in this, uh, in this scenario, the maybe, uh, maybe number 10 would think that they are sort of killing two birds with one stone, where you've got naval expansion in order to beat an external threat, while at the same time uh, quelling Scottish independence by buying off a load of voters in Glasgow. Do you think that might be something that's on the cards? It's absolutely spot on. I mean, uh, I wrote a piece called The Battle for Scotland. And what's interesting is um, using my social algorithms, Fracture takes place when a system is in decline and there's less to go around. And so the system breaks into subunits that then become more adaptable in resourcing less resources, so to speak. So America, for example, is polarizing into two polarizing entities, which is very typical of decline because one thinks they have the answer and the other thinks they have the answer. But it's an adaptation dynamic. So the question over Scotland and the breakup of the union has been asked and strategically I don't think Britain can afford to release Scotland because the British Isles become indefensible yes. without those northern waters and control of you know the Iceland Faroes gap all the things that go with it that actually make us safe and Europe safe so strategically it's a very very dangerous concept and you know the SNP I think underneath it all have a very destructive agenda way beyond their own aspirations of personal power. And the unraveling of the Western system as we know it, it is somewhere in there. Uh, and if you look at their origins back in the Second World War where they were Nazi supporters, there are some fascinating early, which are never talked about, the origins of the SNP. Oh, yes. I mean, and so. essentially that, and I think things, systems that are born with a construct continue with that value set, even if it becomes covert. So, you know, what does it look like? Um, the difficulty you've got is that you know they are hell bent on separation, despite you know impoverishing the Scottish people in the process. It's just not economically viable. So the argument isn't around the economy; it's an emotional process. Yes. And they think that they are replicating Brexit by leaving Europe. We left Europe because we were expansive, and Europe was contractive, and therefore we would s unconsciously be more successful breaking away. If Scotland breaks away from Britain, it would implode. And there are only two options. The EU, which is not going to fund them with their debt dynamic, or the Chinese, or the Russians, because strategically it disables Europe. That's the greatest threat. And then you've got to ask whether the swing voters, essentially, that would vote for the SNP choice of uh, you know, independence, are prepared to do so for a foreign flag. And I think the Scots wouldn't do it for love nor money. That's why she doesn't talk about it. You have to ask whether the Chinese consulate is the biggest in Europe in Scotland, inverted commas, not to discuss, but should be discussed. So I agree with you about the idea that it would help the electorate. But the trouble is, the SNP is sort of <laughs> a dangerous entity that doesn't seek the security of the United Kingdom. And so the more you put into their hands, the, the, you know, and, and suddenly they manage to do something which, because Westminster makes a mistake, makes us vulnerable. So there's a balance between it. But I would argue the energy is for the union to continue. 
because when something expands, it agglomerates smaller units around it, and I cannot see a small unit like Scotland breaking away from Britain as it becomes relatively more successful. And the vaccine story is, the, is really the epitomization of that energy. They benefited from a larger system that was expansive and successful. On that, on that note, because I, I do agree broadly with, uh, with what you say there, but just for example, to play devil's advocate, as the SNP doesn't, not overtly at least, have uh, you know, foreign, foreign policy ambitions, uh, could it not be that the SNP would, in the event of an independence vote uh, and it voting to leave, could it not be that they would simply lease all of the strategic assets like Faslane and the, uh, the Air Force That would be the logical process, and in return we fund a country which is bankrupt. Yeah. And uh, that, is, that is the hope in that circumstance. I've just long since come in contact with destructive energies, and they're always more destructive than you imagine, and they don't follow logical paths that actually would suit both sides and be constructive. And the thing that drives the S&P is probably more destructive than is publicly perceived. So uh, I would just, you know, I think it's a dangerous process, and Westminster needs to manage it very carefully. But remember, the energies are on its side, so actually the risk is it mismanages it. And as we go on and you know, we go through more economic trauma and as the S&P has allowed more rope to go and show just economically how they mismanage their system, whether it's the comparison in the NHS, in the Scottish and English NHS, obviously it's a poor comparison, whether it's the way that the lockdown protocols have been enacted. There are more and more examples building of mismanagement in government and the longer that can happen, the more obvious it is. I do wonder, uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, how we've got sort of political, political polarisation now, uh, you know, here in, in England there is, uh, in fact, we've got two-party state now, the Liberal Democrats don't really have anything like the kind of influence they used to. Meanwhile, in Scotland, it's a one-party state. Uh, I, I seem to, you know, my, my observation of it is that we're becoming a lot more American and that there's now this sort of, uh, we've, got two part, we've just got two parties. And at the same time, there's more American influence when you're looking at some of the, uh, you know, the protests we've seen. Uh, a lot of that you know, originates from America with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and at the same time, uh, a lot, we just see a lot more American culture here in the UK. I wonder, in terms of you know, the future of the UK and the US, what that special relationship, as it was described, what that looks like going forward. I would love to talk about it, but you've really touched on some interesting things. And that is, imagine America's empire curve you know, is basically doing this, yep. and Britain's empire curve is doing this. So look at Black Lives Matter. In America, it's a point of fracture because they have always been a segregated society and it's just a matter of the degrees of segregation. And as basically the base of the pyramid becomes poorer, mostly black people are greatly influenced by that. You create separation, so it's fracture. In Britain, I would argue that when that energy transits across the Atlantic, this is about the establishment of our new cultural self. It's the process of creating a proper meritocracy that is racially without discrimination. And it's about mobilizing all of our society rather than parts of it, which is exactly what happens in Ascension. So although it looks like the same label, I think the social process taking place is fundamentally different. It's unitary it, rather it, than disruptive. Exactly right. So I, and you look at the responses, they are different. This is an intractable problem over here. Here it's about recognizing our past and learning the lessons. I do not believe we should eradicate our history. Our history is there and we are built upon it, but we can use it to inspire better ways forwards. And racial meritocracy is absolutely a fantastic concept to create. How we do it is our challenge. You can't just put a black person in a job because you've created, if they can't do the job. You need to be capable as well as populating with every aspect of society. So we need to balance that. But I think it's a different energy. Over here, it's a fracture is fracture is fracture. It's intractable until they collapse in a heap. So very different. I think in terms of political dynamics, Again, Britain is trying to re-engineer another form of politics. So old Western politics that we had up until this stage and America had represented wealth distribution, wealth creation in some oscillation. Labour Party was an extreme distribution policy, you know, a party, and the Conservatives were a wealth creation party. The Republicans created wealth and the Democrats, you know, but it, America's success was in, it move in its heyday. They were very incremental movements, so the course was fairly consistent. In Britain's case of decline, it was a seesaw of destruction. No money left. Oh, put some more money in. Whoops, lost it. Spend it all again. What I think we've seen, and no one's articulated in the press, is the Conservative government have rolled into accidentally, and they still haven't articulated, they have become a simultaneous wealth creation, wealth distribution party. 
And in that process, if they can master it, they've over-egged the distribution at the moment, and they've done things that are not so wise in the way they've done it. But the concept of distributing and creating simultaneously is a new form of Western politics. And it means that the Labour Party are dead in their boots. They don't even know they've been shot. They're not even going to you know, get out the chocks until they reinvent themselves because the next party that can challenge the Conservatives or iteration of our party names has to have the ability to effectively create wealth and distribute it. And then the judgment is how effectively you do the two things, not whether you're distributing or creating. And I think we've seen that revolution and that's one that Boris sits on top and will give him more longevity than people appreciate. Could you expand on that a bit with the uh, a party that can both uh, create and redistribute wealth? Because, of course, during uh, lockdown, there's not been too much of the whole wealth you know, creation event going on. Well, well, that's the Conservatives' problem right now, is the Conservatives sort of have forgotten their creation policies. And they need to th 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 certainly master distribution on an epic <laughs> scale, you know, almost irresponsibly in some cases. Right. But they need to hone their, the creation policies. And those creation policies are around low tax, and, and basically private sector investment, not just from the people in this country, but from Europe and America. If you lowered it, just imagine this vision. If Britain, and this is not about a moral imperative, not about rich people should be taxed more, it's how you make everyone richer. You create a flat tax and you attract all the capital from Europe and America as their systems failed. And then suddenly the whole system just super explodes of the upside because you've got IP being invested in appropriately, not just at universities and ideas, but through to manufacturing and production should be our image. We have the potential to create that. But the Conservatives uh, and this move towards higher national uh, NI tax was a disaster because it was you know, part of the mandarins in the Treasury thinking, well, you get more money by taxing more. You don't. Laffer was absolutely right. Lower taxes to a certain point bring in more capital. Then you can distribute it more effectively. So the Conservative vision should be we're the most effective creation party by being bold and creating a series of ladders to a flat tax, get rid of all the you know, HMRC people that we don't need, make the whole system streamlined, small government, and at the same time we're going to be really smart in how we distribute to our infrastructure to make us increasingly competitive. That should be their image. It's there for the taking. Well, I, I wish I could be as optimistic as you, David, about the path uh, the government is taking. But going back to the, the UK-US relationship, could you uh, expand on that there? Because I find it very interesting when you speak of uh, the UK being in its ascendancy while the USA is in its decline. And that's obviously, this is, it was it's the other way around. Reversal. Yeah, so, yeah. so we talked about this before we sat down formally. Um, you know, the special relationship was really a consolation prize for Britain. Yep. It was, you know, you've lost your empire, chaps, <laughs> and we're dominant, and yeah, well, as you know, our old cousins will give you, and, and also because we did share common values, to be fair. We're not European. We are more like each other than, we have huge differences, but we are more similar than any two nations, you know, other nations in the Commonwealth, but similar in that respect. Um, the dynamic is now very different. America is in terminal decline. It just can't do the things it thought it could do to shore up. People don't want American values because look what America is. So the exportation of, of the processes of even Hollywood stories, I think, is actually lessening in its appeal. And Britain, on the other hand, is just the only country in the West that's truly reasserted democracy. What an incredible feat to go through the energy of a civil war and contain it within the boundaries of law and constitution. It is one of democracy's greatest achievements. So we've been revalidated as a democracy. So, and America is far from it on the other part of the piece. So, so, and we're expansive. And, and the speed at which we've taken that expansive stance is really fascinates me. It's been lightning quick in you know, a short space of time. Yes, it's been driven by the need to, because our European friends don't want us to succeed. But you know, Liz Truss and team have really picked up the baton brilliantly to spread the word. Maybe the fine print of the, the agreements could need a little bit more you know, scrutiny. And I suspect that, that speed and rapidity have overwhelmed the details within those contracts, which I think is a little concerning. But, you know, change doesn't happen without second and third iterations. And the first right. iteration is encouraging. But we've also got to fill the gaps in that strategy. You know, it, it's a very, a very bullish, uh, a bullish case you make for Britain. Um, and potentially, 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 of course, it's going to feel lumpy, because we're all about to get swamped by an asset price collapse. So the whole of the Western economy is about to hit the skids. So this process is, when I describe a bullish scenario, this isn't a yeehaw, brilliant, let's have a party feeling. 
this takes place despite <laughs> some pretty horrendous setbacks. Yes. So I need to, you know, there are no rose-colored glasses here. It's an underlying movement and change which takes place. It's a bit like someone's character growing despite the fact their face is in the mud and they're crawling through the barbed wire. It's the same process. They are growing individually, but man, it doesn't look good from the outside. Builds character. Yeah, exactly right. So, so one of the things that our government needs to do is build resilience. And they haven't examined resilience questions sufficiently because resilience is about taking the blow and bouncing back faster than the competitors. And we will bounce back faster than our competitors to blows, as we did do in the pandemic. But we could manage that even better. Now, David, you have been very generous with your time. We shall be uh, we shall tie this up soon. But there is uh, just a just to close with. It, I'd like to look at some of the, the investment implications of uh, some of your predictions because they are really quite radical. The you know the future uh, that you see in terms of uh, what you should take away and how you should position yourself as an investor. You don't need to be hugely specific, but just when you're looking at sectors, uh, countries, currencies, what would you favour and what would you disfavour? So currencies. I think sterling is the safe haven. Yeah, uh, my preferred currency in all of this, the things which I'm going to describe, sterling is the place to be. Yes, Even I, if you were a foreign investor? Uh, sterling is the place to be, I reiterate it. You know, I think you know, cable might come back, sort of 10 big figures, worst case, but then it's going to you know, multiples, 152. It's your safe place. So that's currency for the reasons I've just described. Uh, Japan's too close to China. Europe's a basket case. America's a declining hegemon, where do you put your money? Switzerland, yes, it's got lots of mountains to surround it. And there's Britain with an energy that of change. So that's the reserve currency. I, in terms of um, debt, so a correlation, in Breaking the Code of History, I talked about this. So empires basically in their cycle require debt to build their competitive advantage. They borrow from themselves, but they pay it back when they become the dominant hegemon and they become debt-free somewhere around maturity. In overextension decline, they start to borrow like in billary as much as the world will give them. And in the case of America, there's just no stopping them because there's no one to pass the baton to of equal power. Britain had a very similar curve, and it was saved in some ways by passing the baton to America yep. on a relative basis. So debt is just out of control, and it's unsustainable, and we are on for a US Western debt crisis. Uh, especially with the forces of inflation which are building. And the equity market is a product of the bubble at the end of the system. This isn't the peak, if you look at it. The equity market's coincidence with empire power curves we've talked about are not the one and the same thing. No. In fact, the irony is the peak of the, of the equity market is happening right at the end of the cycle because of the, 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 the multiple leverage created by the debt that's issued to the nth extreme. So I think they're all on the edge. I think we've seen our peaks. I think inflation is systematic, and inflation will bring about the, the, the rollover of the equity cycle as bonds start to increase and require higher yields. Not just about inflation, but also the issue of can sovereigns pay under this environment. And we will see, a, you know, I think, in the next quarter, three in the, in the weeks and months ahead of us, it's, it's a now thing, an accelerated risk-off process. And that risk off will lead to the last surge in the dollar before it turns over and equities, US bonds and the dollar all move down together. So this is really, as I call it, the end of <laughs> the doomsday bubble. I call it the doomsday bubble because it's the end of an empire cycle and there's no way of coming back for it. When you land, the central bank proves to be impotent because they've shot everything they can up until this moment and inflation becomes absolutely out of control. Those are the forces that the Fed cannot control or any other central bank. And we get to the bottom and then we live through stagflation at least for the next four years and destroy whatever wealth we have. So this is a wealth destructive phase with a multiplicity that makes conventional management very hard. There's, and the only asset classes which provide in the first stages of this any kind of survivability of precious metals. And I think actually precious metals are just about to wake up. They've done their basing corrections since last year, and they're in the steps ready to move. Just to play uh, devil's advocate when it comes to central banks having shot all their ammunition, um, you know, myself included, I, I never would have thought they'd been able to get as far as they have, and yet they have. When you say that they, you know, they've thrown the kitchen sink at it and there's, there's nothing left, left in the armory, do you not think there's maybe you know, negative interest rates and just doing QE to the nth well, degree might, might well, save it? Okay, so, so you've got the Fed holding up the illusion that America is fiscally solvent. Um, in terms of its empire model, it's had a sequence of reversals 
Afghanistan being like the serious problem. It faces a hegemonic challenger that's of equal economic power as itself. Greater purchasing parity already. So those things, when you look at the external forces of hegemonic challenge and swap, have never been greater. We've never had those conditions. And at the same time, we've taken an already debt-ridden society and we pumped even more debt into it to the nth extreme in the past year at a rate which is unprecedented. And the consequences are really interesting. That is, every manager, that most of the core managers, whether they're hedge funds, but they're not really the long-only funds, are now, after 10 years of this process, beta managers. Any alpha generator who's maverick, who wanted to pick the high, has been flipped out by the sustenance of the process. Yep. I, in my 35 years, have never seen a financial system that is so skewed to one mindset and the belief the Fed will always guarantee their outcomes. And when you get to that complete coherence of one-way positioning, you know that the only the other way is open. And that's where we are now. Right. Well, very, very intimidating indeed. Uh, when you're looking at, say, British assets, I mean, the, the FTSE would not be sheltered from a, a, you know an entire Western developed market uh, nope. you know, blowout, as you describe. Uh, and you're looking at uh, precious metals, so like, you know, gold and silver, as you say, you know, they've had a, they've had a rough time over the last uh, few months. But you think they're going to be really quite key going forward out of this? I think they're, you know, in terms of my client base and, you know, and family offices and high net worth individuals, that's a strategy which maintains wealth and, more importantly, makes money from something where every other part of your asset base will go the one way with a coherence of one. With the, will the inflation that you anticipate, would that sell, solve the debt problem or would that actually, or do you expect you might see something like a debt jubilee? I think it'll be a debt jubilee. It'll be, there'll be an awful lot of 100-year debt. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid that it will be a debt jubilee. Now, what's interesting about it, in a strange way, and this is like a, you know, a phoenix rising from the ashes, if you remove the Western debt burden, the mindset changes because you don't have to fund the debt anymore and yeah. actually you can lower your taxes and stimulate your economy a different way. So I think this isn't all bad. None of these things are all bad because they represent change and evolution. And right now we have got to make our Western economies competitive with China to just support our arms race, which is going to accelerate. So it, it may feel bad and you know I've traded Russian debt crisis, Argentine debt crisis, and what's interesting Which is one? <laughs> both very successfully right. pick the highs, pick the lows. So, you know, in my career, you know, I've seen them all, and that's why I see this as a very similar paradigm. I have a, you know, a reasonably good track record of picking them, and this has all the hallmarks. But at the bottom of it, that debt jubilee could actually liberate the system. The trouble is that stagflation is now going to stop it from, and it's all it's going to have to go to a high growth, low taxation model where private sector investment develops new IP that comes online faster than we've seen before. That's our only way out of this. One last question on, on markets, just in terms of uh, commodities and again with uh, emerging markets. When you're thinking of the rise of China, does, uh, does that sort of Chinese imperialism make emerging markets in you know, Southeast Asia uninvestable or just very, very dangerous? Well, a sphere of influence is particularly relevant. So, for example, if you look at America, they are really trying to secure Southern America and eject the... F they, they've quite rightly worked out that they've got to counter China's debt colonialism and their back door is the first place to do it. So they're offering a counter move in South America. They should also offer the same counter move in, in, Ameri in Africa because if you remove the resource basket that China feeds upon, you constrict its growth. So I would make those Western focuses. The whole South China Sea is a battle zone and a contested battle zone that really the West has lost control of. The US Navy doesn't control areas inside the second island chain. In that respect, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, they're all extremely vulnerable. And you almost have to mentally as a strategic planner consider you may lose them unless you're prepared to go to war at that moment. And as we found out with Hitler and Czechoslovakia and the Sudeten lands, when you take incremental small chunks, actually bigger systems are slow to respond. Yes. So the trick is being out of the sphere of influence that you can see immediately falling under Chinese control. And if you're gonna choose resources and companies with resources, make sure they're in the Western sphere of influence where we control them and will do you know, for the years ahead. Well, David, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your engagement and, and sharp questions. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Great.
Well, there you have it, folks. That was David Murren. A fascinating conversation. I wish we would had more time as we would have been able to discuss so many other subjects, but I do hope you found that stimulating. If you are interested in learning more, he has plenty on his website and, of course, his book, which is fascinating, Breaking the Code of History. He tells me there are only a few hundred more hard copies of this available before they'll have to just do the e-publishing route. So if you do like the real thing, do be sure to get a copy of it using the website that's displayed on the screen now. But that is all from me for the moment. Hope you enjoyed the interview, and we'll see you in the next one.